Welcome to Virtual Adaptation, a series of intermittent videos where we'll be looking at games that were inspired by or adapted from something else, a novel, a film, a TV show, or even a certain personal event. It'll be a neat little thing to do from time to time, something that shows how inspirational certain things have been in the relatively modern world of games. Now there were a lot of things I could have gone for first off, loads of big hitters, aliens say, or Shakespeare, or even like World War II. However, I wanted to go off kilter a little bit and do something that I've always been interested in and want to know more about, but also has a lot of intriguing games associated with it. And so here we are, Virtual Adaptation Episode 1, Journey to the West. So what is Journey to the West? Written in the 16th century and usually attributed to the author Wu Chen En, Journey to the West is regarded as one of the four great novels of classical Chinese literature, alongside The Water Margin, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and Dream of the Red Chamber. From what I can tell, this doesn't seem to be an official marker as such, more just a consensus amongst Chinese literary critics that's developed over the years. Now, Red Chamber is a bit more modern and doesn't have too many video game adaptations or references from what I can tell, aside from some H game and a little section in Christine Love's visual novel Hate Plus. I could have easily done this first episode on the other two. Water Margin, the story of a group of 108 bandits who form an uprising but end up working for the government, has influenced many games, in particular Konami's Suikoden series of RPGs. As for the Three Kingdoms, jeez. Even if you were to completely take out Koei's titular series of strategy games and the humongous Dynasty Warriors series of action strategy games, you're still left with literally tons of titles. Journey to the West is a little bit more manageable. In Journey to the West, a monk named Janzan, a real person who really did this, leaves Chan'an and travels all the way to India. His motivations in both reality and the book are the same. Disappointed with the quality of Chinese translations of Buddhist scripture, he decides to go direct to the source despite a travel ban imposed on the region by the Emperor Taizong. He is helped on his quest by four disciples, the most famous of which is Sun Wukong, the Monkey King. Trapped by Buddha for rebelling against heaven, helping Zhan Zan is a form of repentance that doesn't involve being stuck under a mountain for 500 years. Rukon is highly intelligent, very strong, and prone to excessive violence with his retractable seven-ton fighting rod, much to Jan Zan's distress, meaning he has to give him a migraine via the headband he's forced to wear. If there's any one character that you recognise from Journey to the West, it's probably this one. Ultimately, Zhan Zan completes his journey and returns to Chan'an a hero, devoting the rest of his life to making better translations of Buddhist text. Wukong and the rest of the gang end up as deities for their exploits. Journey to the West's influence as a piece of literature cannot be overestimated, not just for its characters, but for its structure. Most of the book is episodic, taking three to four chapters to deal with a certain event that happens to the group on their journey, a sort of purposeful serialisation that, while probably not the first book to do such a thing, brings to mind the structure of no end of TV shows. It's no wonder then that the book's been adapted to television tons of times. British folk may recall Monkey, originally shown by NHK in Japan and then brought over here and dubbed by the BBC. There's been tons more, and more still to be made. Into the Badlands is a loose American adaptation of the story, and Netflix have a direct one in the pipeline. But of course most of the adaptations are from Asian TV, and no matter how many times the story is told, it's basically always a massive hit. Apparently one in three Japanese television viewers watched a 2006 adaptation of the book, which kinda says a lot. So, um, what of the video games, Lin? The games that directly adapted Journey to the West are a ragtag bunch to say the least. We have an old school arcade game, a PlayStation RPG, high effort unlicensed titles, a cult hit from the last generation, and we've got one of the worst video games of all time. There's a lot of other games that have referenced the book, including some of the biggest games around today, and we'll round some of those up at the end. But first we'll look at the more direct adaptations. We begin with Sun Sun, an early arcade game by Capcom released in 1984. In this game you play as either Sun Sun, Sun Wukong, or Tun Tun, and you travel across 20 levels in order to reach Buddha after the rest of the squad gets kidnapped. The levels consist of six continuous platforms that Sun Sun can either jump down or up from, and lots of enemies. Fortunately, your fighting ward can fire balls of energy at them, so it's not all doom and gloom. You can collect stuff for points, and you get an extension every 20,000. 
So, yeah, it's a typical arcade game, really. Actually, I find Sun Sun to be quite fun. It starts off kind of sedate, but it doesn't take long for the game to get hectic. And the continuous levels definitely make me want to go again to see if I can get any further. There's also some kicks to be had from all the collectibles that Sun Sun can grab. Mostly food, such as cherries, fish, watermelon, and that classic 7th century Chinese staple, french fries. There's not a whole lot to say about it, but it's a cool game. A nice little proto-temple one. It's the simplest adaptation of the source material. A violent monkey carrying a staff will probably make for a pretty fun video game character. We'll see this quite a lot. Sun Sun is also notable for being the first Capcom game to hit arcades in the USA, although I don't think it was particularly successful. It only received one port to the Famicom in 1985, which unfortunately was developed by Micronix. Micronix worked on a few of Capcom's early NES ports, most notably Ghosts and Goblins, and unfortunately they cannot code for shit. Sun Sun on the Famicom looks reasonably accurate, but then it moves, and you're greeted to horrendous slowdown whenever more than one enemy appears on the screen. It's terrible. It is at least a little easier, mind you. And hey, that's not all for Sun Sun. In 1989, a sequel was released for the PC Engine only. This is a different game, a much more traditional platformer, with nice enough graphics and music. Of course, it can be tricky for such a game to stand out on the PC Engine, and I rather prefer the arcade game for being a bit less generic. Finally, Sun Sun, or rather Sun Sun the Third, the granddaughter of Sun Sun, made an appearance as a playable character in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and he also appears as a collectible in the Wii puzzle game Zack and Wiki. So far then, we've already seen Sun Sun do well in the arcades, but flounder somewhat in the home. Mind you, when it comes to floundering in the home, Sun Sun on the NES has nothing whatsoever on the next game. Well, this game is probably the main reason why I wanted to make this video. I don't really do bad games that are flat out bad. They've got to be interesting. They've got to be something like Takeshi's Challenge, for example. Something that's purposefully awful but has a fantastic background. One of the best examples of Japanese Kasoge, or shitty game. But as far as the best example of Kasoge goes, there is only one choice. A game that's hilariously terrible to the point of absolute bafflement without having the excuse of a famous TV star who hated technology drunkenly designing a video game. If you watch Contendo, you'll know that some god-awful games never left the shores of Japan. But none of them compare to Super Monkey Die Boken. Little is known about the game in spite of its legendary status. It was published by VAP, a Japanese media company who mostly did TV and music. In fact, they actually produced the original Monkey television series, which is something of a connection. The actual developers of the game, however, remain anonymous. Well, with one exception. A secret message hidden in the game's code that reads as follows. Designer Kaoru Nakajima, 26 years old, born 1960 in Toyokawa City, Aichi Prefecture. I want to lick some pussy. I want a perverted miss. I like vagina and the clitoris. Who said that games programmers weren't wittier? Every day's like the frickin' Algonquin round table, don't you know? This is Mr. Nakajima's first credit, and his last was actually on character art for Super Smash Bros. on the Wii U, so he's stuck around. You know, despite making this game. The game is, um, oblique. You start on this small island with a quite ugly landscape. I know enough to know that the exit here is just inside the mountains, but there is no indicator that the exit is there. Get used to that. Even if you see a dead end, it might be an invisible exit. Once you're on a bigger island, the game begins in earnest. You control a group as they walk to where who the hell even knows. Every so often you get into a battle, where you play as Wukong. These battles mostly involve flailing your wad around everywhere, although if you press both buttons you can fly on a cloud. Wukong is a magic user after all. Usually these battles just end without much resolution and you continue on. The coding is so bad that the colours in the level seem to be entirely different when you return, and the graphics kind of speak for themselves, being very low quality indeed, although the game does manage to implement a day-night cycle. The difficulty is unforgiving. You get no clues as to where you need to go at all. I guess you could just head west, but you will end up reaching the sea eventually. If you're lucky, you'll stumble upon a house where you can replenish your food and drink. This, I presume, represents the friendly Buddhists that Zhanzan and company met on their journey. 
If your food and drink meters run out, then you lose energy and ultimately die, which is how most playthroughs end, or you get stuck on some tiny island with no way of getting off of it. The game is brutal like that, and the huge map features almost no actual landmarks. I guess you could call this game an RPG, but I can't think of any RPG that's even remotely like this. When they made Super Monkey Die Boken, they broke the mould. There's no way you could ever make something quite so bad again. VAP put their name to a few other games, but none of them are even remotely as awful as this one. The folks at Game Center CX spent a whole season trying to beat the game, and ultimately managed it with the help of the viewing public. There's even loading times here, in a cartridge game. Super Monkey Die Boken assuredly deserves its reputation. It's the worst of the worst, far more terrible than anything by, say, LJN. And yet it's just so freaking weird and baffling that it's impossible even to be angry at it. It's just like, what happened here? How did this get past? And did Kairu Nakajima ever find his perverted miss? So many questions that simply cannot be answered. Perhaps we should just move on. Right, we're not finished with the NES. We have two side-scrollers from Jalico next that form the Sayuki World series of games, one of which you might actually know. The first of these games from 1989 is yeah, quite decent actually, a very typical side-scrolling game with the odd bit of platforming. There's a lot of shops along the way where you can buy various power-ups, as well as upgrade your sword and shield. It's funny, um, does it remind you of any particular game? Yes, I would say that this game is very much inspired by Wonder Boy in Monsterland. It's not as good as that game as it does feature some quite annoying parts, but it's not bad at all. The second game, Sayuki World 2, well if the first game was influenced by Wonder Boy, this second one's all about Mega Man. After the first stage you get to play the other six in whichever order you want, and you get a power up at the end of each one. The stages follow much the same style too, with different parts, horizontal and vertical bits, and bosses that are weak to particular power-ups. This time around, Wukong does have his fighting wad as opposed to a sword, which is good. As much as this is, well, ripping off Mega Man, it's still a good game. And it got released in the West too. The game was localised as Wampum in 1991, and Wukong was replaced by a Native American protagonist. It's hard for platformers to stand out on the NES, but it's worth a look. It's not as good a Mega Man homage as Little Samson, but it's not quite as expensive. There's a bit more to find on the 8 and the 16 bits for Journey to the West if you look at the unlicensed world, and they're both a lot better than Super Monkey Die Boken. First up, here's a Chinese NES game from 1994 simply titled Journey to the West. This was published by Micro Genius and developed by a studio named Taijin Dadon. It seems to be a fairly original work as these fins go, it's hard to tell what assets it's using or anything like that. The game is a typical side-scrolling platformer, it's pretty far from great with incredibly wonky jumping and some seriously frustrating enemy placement, but eh, it's actually not terrible really. You could get used to it, especially if you fancy something of a challenge. The second unofficial game is probably better known, Legend of Wukong, a Taiwanese role-playing game by GameTech from 1996 that received an English translation and release from Super Fighter Team in 2008. This game plays a bit looser with the story. Wukong is a boy from more futuristic times who plays around with his uncle's time machine and ends up transported back to the Tan Dynasty. There's monsters about, and they whisk said time machine away. Wukong ends up donning the classic monkey outfit, and he's on a journey to get his machine back. What you have here then is a typical turn-based JRPG, one that does actually have particularly nice graphics in a lot of places and some really good music. The quality of the translation is excellent, and I would say it's very good for an unlicensed game. However, it does fall down in some places. The graphics for enemies and dungeons are kind of boring, and the game can be a real monotonous grind. Seriously, the start of it is nothing but grinding, not helped by only ever facing one enemy type in an area. Apparently the grind does get better after the first dungeon, but it's really long. You've got some very dense fantasy style like mazes for the dungeons too, meaning that this game can be a real challenge. On the whole, it's okay, but not a game that I'd ever stick with. Your own mileage may vary. 
Our last big game here is a much more modern affair. 2010's Enslaved Odyssey of the West by Ninja Theory, released for the 360, PS3, and eventually the PC, which is the version we're playing. This is a futuristic and post-apocalyptic take on the story. You play as Monkey, and you start on a slave ship. You escape thanks to an unknown woman's sabotage, and once you get off you suddenly find that you're under the woman's control thanks to a headband that, as in the novel, can cause quite vicious headaches. It also functions as a dead man's switch. If she dies, you die too. And so Monkey and Trip, for that is her name, start their journey across a shattered world, 300 miles all the way to Trip's home. Details on what happened are scarce, but it has a lot to do with all the mechs that are hanging about everywhere, ready to destroy you and any other human they see. Fortunately, Monkey can beat them with the help of his fighting rod. As in the novel, it's retractable, it weighs a ton, and it can have multiple users. Trip also has plenty of users too. She can use decoys, fire EMP blasts at enemies when she's in danger, cause distractions. All of these definitely help when getting past the mechs. This game is... Well, first off, it looks amazing, especially on the PC. Some really great surroundings, from the dilapidated New York in the beginning to the barren wastes you end up in. It's glorious, and it plays very well too. Some people might worry about an entire game that features escorting someone else, but Enslaved doesn't do a bad job at all, and it helps that the relationship between Monkey and Trip is very well written. It's a lot like um, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time in that regard. The beat-em-up action is fine, it's not Platinum Games quality or anything, but it's perfectly good. I tend to prefer the platforming and puzzling elements though, as opposed to actually fighting the mechs. Enslaved is a very worthwhile game. It probably has one of the strongest stories of any game from the last generation, with heavy involvement from Andy Serkis, who voices Monkey, and Alex Garland. It's inspired a lot by games like Ico, and it's a really great usage of the classic story, using a lot of the details of Journey to the West to excellent effect. I would say that as far as both game and adaptation go, it's pretty easily the best game in this video. In fact, nothing else comes even remotely close. Irritatingly, however, the game ended on something of a cliffhanger, and underwhelming sales, Namco Bandai hoped for a million but only just got less than half that, meant that any plans for a sequel were cancelled. Damn shame. Still, the PC version is on sale pretty often, and I definitely recommend it. There are a few other monkey-centric games that should be mentioned, although not to the detail of the others, to be honest. First up, here's Chuka Tyson, or Cloudmaster, an arcade shoot-em-up from 1988 by Taito. This is, of course, based on Wukong's ability to ride around on clouds. Personally, I really don't like this game. Your sprite is way too freaking big, and it's a frustrating coin muncher right from the get-go with strange enemies, but forgettable backgrounds. Really not good. It's even worse on the Master System. It was ported to other consoles, but this is the one I know, and I believe it only came out in Europe. Also, there's Yayuki. This is a Japanese-only NES game, and it's a graphical text adventure. Obviously, I would like to say something about this, but I don't understand it, so I can't. There's also three PlayStation games that take cues from the monkey, and by far the most interesting of these is Sayaku Journey West, an isometric strategy RPG by Koei. This feels like a fairly straight adaptation. You play as a monk, and after a vision, you're sent on the journey to India. Pretty soon you run into everyone's favourite monkey, named Sangoku here, and he'll join your party. If you like strategy RPGs, then this might be for you, if you like Disgaea and stuff like that. It is tough though, as with a lot of these games, if the main character dies, then it's game over. The game seems to be pretty well written, mind you. Not a bad, obscure PS1 title. The other two games are awful. Monkey Hero is one of the cheapest and most miserable Zelda Ape in action RPGs I've ever had the misfortune to come across, I'm afraid. Monkey Magic is a fairly lousy side-scrolling platformer by Sunsoft that's licensed from an anime series, complete with very annoying voice acting. Both of these are pretty loose adaptations. Basically, they just take the monkey character and then pretty much do their own thing, and neither are worth playing. That about does it for the games, but there are a few extras. The character of Sun Wukong in particular has certainly been referenced in various places. There are playable characters based on the monkey kin in League of Legends, Dota 2, and Smite amongst others. He has also featured as a playable character in the Warriors Orochi series, specifically Warriors Orochi 3. The Infernape Pokemon is based on him, and he is referenced as a boss in Sonic Blast for the Game Gear. 
For Chinese New Year, Overwatch gave several of its characters costumes that referenced Journey to the West. Naturally, Winston became Wukong, while Weinhardt, Roadhog and Zenyatta also got related costumes. There are also a few MMORPGs, mostly Asian ones naturally, that have either referenced or been based on Journey to the West, which naturally I can't show much of here. And whew, that about does it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this first instalment of Virtual Adaptation, where we've seen a whole bunch of appearances and references for this classic Chinese book. Hopefully I didn't miss any out, but I'm sure I probably did. Of course there's a whole bunch of even more famous references to the story in films and television too, but yeah, it's perhaps best to just stick to video games on this one. If there's anything that you'd like to see covered in this series going forward, then do let us know in the comments below. But until then, as ever, I shall say, bye for now! Thanks for watching this video. If you like this video then do please like it, do consider subscribing to the channel and also following me on my Facebook, Twitter as well as my Patreon where you can find all sorts of different pledges for you. Anyway, for this video I would like to thank the following. Adam Schaefer, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Audi Sawley, Conformist, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Gruff and Blackpool, Guy Middleton, Ian Roberts, James Itt, James Loveridge, Jason Durso, Jason Goy, Jason Leach, Jason Stevens, Johan Eriksson, John Scott, Josh Jensen, L. O'Brien, Lee Norris, ManagerSim.net, Mark Heslop, Mark Johnston, Mark Whittington, Martin Pataki, Lynette McCrone, Olaf Albeen, Pete Morris, Peter Jack, Peter Sidon, Phil Taprog, Potter Margell, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Wyatt Coleman, Sean Zoltek, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Taylor Armand, Leon Natural, Tanya J, Twisted Squote, Vishar D, Yurka Operator, and Zach Roach. <laughs>